So this is the slide where we left off. No, oh, this is the next one. This is the slide that we ended yesterday. All right. So here we go. So jobs. I mean, it's not that you can't. I guess it would help be helpful if I turned on the screen. Huh? I guess you could earn a mechanic certificate with an airframe rating and a power plant rating on it just because you wanted one. Or you owned an airplane and you wanted to do most of the maintenance on it. But I think most people earn mechanic certificates with airframe and power plant ratings because they want to get a job and get paid money. I, uh, that was one of the reasons why I earned my A&P. Uh, I guess this is where we left off. General aviation is all flying except for the airlines and the military. So that's where we left off. So whether it's a Cessna 152 or a Piper Tomahawk or a big business jet that goes 600 miles an hour and holds 20 people, it's not. those aren't airlines and those aren't the military, and therefore it falls under the term general aviation. And if you went to a shop in Fresno, there's probably two or three maintenance facilities in Fresno that do general aviation maintenance. And they'll work on anything from a little two-seater with a four-cylinder piston-powered gasoline engine all the way up to big uh, business jets. Sometimes it's even referred to as GA. So there we go, reciprocating airplanes, turbine airplanes, helicopters. Essentially, general aviation is anything except the airlines or the U.S. military. And the reason we break it out this way is because these are actually the regulations that the flying gets done under. The airlines have very strict flying regulations. You don't have to write it down, but it's FAR Part 121. And somebody tell me, how many federal aviation regulations do the U.S. military have to follow? The military does not have to follow any, any FAA regulations. Now, do they follow a lot of FAA regulations? Yeah, they put transponders on their airplanes, they talk on the radio, they file VFR flight plans, they file IFR flight plans. When they go above 18,000 feet, they set their altimeter 29.92. They do a lot of things that civil aircraft do. But you know what? Most pilots in the U.S. military do not hold a pilot certificate. They graduated from military pilot school, and they put their wings under you. But the vast majority of them do not hold a U.S. pilot certificate issued from the FAA. Yeah. So what about the Army? Can you still fly? Oh, can you still fly? If, if you learn to fly in Army pilot wings, you can fly in the Army all the way the Army wants you to can't go to the airport and then go rent an airplane or a helicopter because now you're doing it as a civilian and now you need a civil pilot certificate from the FAA. Now what you can do, and there's, and I don't know all the processes or all the rules, but you can take your military certificate easier to get your civilian pilot certificate, usually by just taking a written pass and then that's it. You don't have to take the check or anything. Could you use the hour military towards your civilian pilot certificates? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. You could take flying lessons. You could fly airplanes in another country and come to the United States, and you could use those out. You can certainly use them for your total flying time. Uh, I won't get into all the details. Are you planning on flying outside of the US, United States and bringing those hours back in? Okay, then. All right, so you can get a job. You know, Carl Smith is a gentleman, and he owns a maintenance company at Reedley International Airport. Of course, he doesn't have anybody working for him. But there are uh, maintenance jobs at Visalia Airport. There's two or three down there, and there's two or three or four. There's at least two general aviation shops at the Fresno Airport, and there's at least two general aviation shops at Chandler, Fresno Chandler Airport. Question? Yeah. Well, 
I was just trying to tell you that general aviation has all kinds of stuff in it. It's not. It's not. And a lot of their first job, for instance, up until lately, most of the airlines, if they wanted to get a job as the, at, at an airline as a mechanic, they would usually say they wanted one, two, three years of maintenance experience after you got your mechanic certificate before you could get that job at the airline. There is, just like there is a pilot shortage in the United States, there is also an aircraft mechanic shortage in the United States. In fact, I was just to a student uh, who's in mechanic school here at Reedley, and he works at SkyWest Airlines in Fresno, and he, he's a detailer. He's one of the people at the end of the day when the airplane comes in, he cleans the interior of the airplane. He's in the airplane again at school, so he doesn't have to do that. Uh, in any case, he said that SkyWest has gotten to where they're hiring right out of school. So I believe I haven't I had I don't have data about Delta Airlines, American Airlines, you know, uh, Southwest Airlines, Alaska Airlines, uh, but my guess is they're probably if they're not getting like that they're close. And of course you can get a job you can go in the U.S. military. And I'm not trying to talk people into going joining the U.S. military. I'm not trying to talk people out of the U.S. military. I happen to have gotten in the U.S. military because when I got mechanic certificate. I got my flight instructor certificate. It was the early 1980s, and uh, aviation was in a slump, and people were getting laid off, and I couldn't get a job as a flight instructor, and I had very uh, difficult time getting a job. I couldn't get a job for a year in Fresno County. I was a welder. I welded mach machines together because I had to work. I went in the U.S. military not because I wanted to get trained to be an airplane mechanic and not because I wanted to join the U.S. military, but because they would give me a job. And I also found out that before I went in, if I did it for three years, I could become a flight engineer and sit behind the pilots and look at all the gauges and run the engines and the electrical system and the hydraulic system and stuff like that. So that's so, but that's still an option for people. Like, for instance, airplane mechanic school at Reedley College is four semesters. If you went to San Joaquin Valley College, it's 16 months straight with no breaks. But if you join the, and then you get paid. But if you join the U.S. military, they start paying you right away. They make you go to six weeks to 12 weeks of basic training. Yay, that's always fun. You know, they shave your head. I mean, they don't shave it. They just buzz cut it down to about a 16th of an inch. It's not like they take out a razor. They don't make it bald. It's just really short. Uh, and then they send you to airplane mechanic school, and they employ you as an airplane mechanic. So the, some people want to do that because they don't want to spend 14, 6, 16 months or four semesters in school. Of course, some people don't want to go into the U.S. military, and so they go to school instead. But that's up to you to figure out. If you ever want to talk about being a mechanic in the Air Force, let me know, because I used to be one. You can also get a job working at a company like Boeing. Or uh, General, or let's see, Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman is uh, building a prototype of another Air Force bomber down in Palmdale, down in the Mojave Desert by Lancaster and Victorville. They're hiring right now, and they like to hire A&P mechanics because they know how to do lots and lots of stuff. You've got a lot of training on using tools, and you tend not to break things. So you can get a job at a manufacturing company building aircraft, and in fact. Uh, about the first six months after I got out of A&P school, I tried to be a flight instructor, and I couldn't make any money as a flight instructor. And a couple of my friends who had gotten out of A&P school with me had gone down to L.A., and they got a job at a helicopter company building helicopters, and they said I had to go down there. So I went down there, and I applied, and that was my first job. As uh, Technically, it was my third job. It was my first job out of mechanic school as a mechanic, and I was building, I was putting helicopters together. And then after eight, ten months, I got laid off. Darn. And then I got another job at another manufacturing plant, and after about a year, I got laid off. And that's when I became a welder, and that's when I decided this really sucked. Not that being a welder sucked, but I wanted to, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted aviation, not... You ever seen those machines that they, they spray stucco on the side of a building? 
It's got a gasoline-powered engine. It's got like a, a bin with a thing that spins around, and it's got like cement and mortar in it. And they can put dye in it to make the stucco be a color. And it, it's got a nozzle on it, and it sprays. I built a frame for those machines. I mean, if, all right. So there are places you can get a job. So let's see how well these movies are going to play. You want to hit the light there, Mr. Flores? Significance and complexity of aircraft maintenance. Maintenance is the least known or understood part of the aviation industry, but planes can't fly without it. The, the modern transport airplane today, it's really a very sophisticated machine. We're dealing with a lot of different technologies that are deployed in the airplane itself, and it's that that kind of brings the whole safety, reliability, comfort, and operational uh, performance that we enjoy today as a traveling public. One thing that many people don't know is that airlines contract much of their maintenance to highly specialized companies that do nothing but maintain, repair, and overhaul aircraft and parts. That's why the aviation maintenance industry is known as MRO. While there are a number of companies that specialize in heavy maintenance, working on the whole aircraft in a big hangar, most work takes place off the aircraft at highly specialized facilities that work on specific parts or components like landing gear, avionics, auxiliary motor units, even seat belts. Airlines can't... So these spots where there's like somebody sitting at a bench, like uh, this person right here, that work... You know, this person's working on a generator or some kind of electric motor. You can get a job at, a, at an airline or a big company that does MRO, maintenance, repair, and overhaul. And you, there are jobs they have where you don't have to have a mechanic certificate. If you're just going to sit there all day and rewire electric motors, that may not be the most thrilling job in the world, but you don't have to go to A&P school to be able to do that. You don't get paid as much. Now, somebody, an inspector, is going to come behind you and inspect your work and make sure you did it right in accordance with FAA regulations. But you can get a job at a maintenance facility, and someone has to inspect your work, but you don't have to have a mechanic certificate. However, there's still plenty of jobs at these MROs, maintenance, repair, and overhaul. There's plenty of jobs at these companies that, where they do need you or do want you to have an A&P mechanic certificate on specific parts or components like landing gear, avionics, auxiliary motor units, even seat belts. Airlines can't afford to have every single piece of equipment being maintained by themselves. So what they do is go to professional maintenance operations that enable them to get the best maintenance at the best price, with reliability and safety at the utmost. The, air, the airline industry is a, it's two things. It's a very, it's a complex industry, as in a high-tech industry. Uh, in order to be able to really supply the, this industry, you do need specialties. You need specialists in different areas. And uh, in the maintenance side, it means having the best at what they do. Because highly specialized repair stations get a better return on their investment in training, tools, and technology, they help airlines reduce maintenance costs while ensuring a high level of safety. In fact, there's been a direct correlation between the use of contract maintenance by airlines in recent decades and a dramatic drop in accidents. One of the reasons for the industry's outstanding safety record is that an infrastructure exists to make sure repair stations get the job done right. Aviation is definitely one of the most regulated and looked at, if you will, audited industries frankly, that I can think of. And you want this. It is because there is so much oversight, so much professionalism, so many skilled, experienced people, from maintainers to pilots to controllers, all of them part of a team that, in fact, give us the greatest safety record in modal transportation. The aviation maintenance industry isn't just critical to safety, it's also critical to the economy. There are more than 4,000 FAA certificated maintenance facilities throughout the United States that together employ close to 200,000 people. 
In fact, there are four times more people working for FAA certificated repair stations in the United States than there are mechanics working for airlines. Most of these repair stations are smaller, family-owned companies. This makes maintenance a huge part of the world economy. There are more than 4,700 aircraft repair facilities worldwide, employing roughly 473,000 people. Small businesses play a huge role in the repair and maintenance and repair and overhaul of uh, aviation worldwide. There's nearly 5,000 uh, businesses that have certificated repair stations. The majority of those employ less than 50 people. So small business is really at the heart of the industry. Uh, it's advancing quickly. It's, it's grown steadily over the last 50 years. Uh, just, and, and the need for it and the, the demand for it is only growing around the world as, as uh, the middle class grows and other parts of the world. Uh, so it is, it's vital from that standpoint. The global aviation maintenance market is expected to grow 50%. Did you hear what he said about the middle class growing? Can anybody what the middle class is? What's that? Yeah, the middle working class. So I'm going to use people that don't make very much money or make barely enough or don't even make enough to survive. And people in the middle that make enough to, 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 to live and maybe make a little bit extra. And then there's very wealthy people. Very rich. Well, if you're already rich, you're already buying airline tickets, right? And if you don't have much money at all and you're having a hard time paying the bills or buying food, you're not buying airline tickets, are you? So if the middle class gets more people in it and they have 10% extra income, they some of those people start spending their money taking airplane trips. So if you look at not the United States, but if you look at the rest of the world, there are big chunks of the world where the middle class is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Take China. It used to be in China. And I'm making up numbers, but it was only one or two or three percent of the people that were really rich, one or two or three percent of the class, and then 95 percent of the people were barely making enough to survive. Well, in China, the economy has gotten a lot better, and because there's more jobs to be had, and a big chunk of this 95 percent have been moving into the middle class. And that means several things. First of all, the middle, those people can now afford to buy a toaster and a television and Internet and an airline ticket. So when the middle class of the country gets bigger, it's because usually the rich percentage stays about the same, but it's the people that don't make much money. That number gets bigger and the middle class gets bigger. That's assuming the economy is getting better which in China it has. So if you're looking at a billion people in China, and now that middle class is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we're talking millions of people that can now afford to buy an airline ticket. So I don't know if China is the biggest growth country in the United States. It's not number one, it's number two. The last 20, 30 years, the economy in China has gotten better and better and better, and more people have been making more money. They're now in the middle class, and they have an extra $100 or $200 or $300 left over every month. And they can buy TV or buy Internet or buy a car or buy airline tickets. So there's, so, and China has not been able to keep up with training pilots, which is a lot of people in China who come to the United States to learn how to fly in China. Like I know of two flight schools uh, in the Phoenix area, and most of their students are students. So... When he says the middle class is growing and that means the airlines do better, it's because there are more people that have the money that can afford to buy airline tickets. So what is he saying now? Holy, well, let's go back up. As uh, the middle class grows in other parts of the world, uh, so it is, it's vital from that standpoint. The global aviation maintenance market is expected to grow 50% over the next decade. 
from $57.7 billion in 2014 to $86.6 billion in 2024. The growth means opportunities for people looking for an exciting career, not just a job. Repair stations are hungry for workers who want to be a part of a dynamic, growing global industry. When I was in high school, as a regular high school student, you were always thinking about, you know, what are you going to do next or whatever. But I was always thinking about five years from now. Where do I see myself five years from now? Uh, this was going to be a temporary job, actually. I, wanted, I was applying for an university in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, uh, and, um, oh, for, uh, for pilots. And once I saw this, and I found out that this is what I wanted to do. No more doubts in my mind what I wanted to do. Well, I'm an avionics technician. We run anything that is ele electronics from the airplane. My job is pretty much removing and replacing components, troubleshooting, finding out, you know, learning a system and running through the whole thing, making sure that the whole system works, that there's no problems. ARSA is the voice of the global aviation maintenance industry. Trade associations like ARSA provide a voice for the industry, with regulators, lawmakers, media, current and potential members of the workforce, and the flying public. If the participants in an industry aren't engaged in an association or some other kind of collective advocacy vehicle, there are a number of risks. I mean, you, number one, obviously risk bad policy. The fact is that in Washington, D.C., if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And so there's a risk that, that Congress is going to impose, impose new legal, legal mandates, they're going to do things that drive up your cost of doing business, that eat into your markets, bad regulations that unnecessarily drive up your cost of doing business. I'm reminded of the words of Ben Franklin, we have to hang together or we're surely going to hang apart. And that is very true when it comes to trade associations. The reality is, if you're not an ARSA member, it means that your uh, voice is not part of our advocacy, it means that your perspectives and our policy making isn't taken into account. Uh, it also means that you're not getting the benefit of, of the services that ARSA provides, the things we do to try to help reduce our members' costs of doing business, to help them be more efficient and be more effective competitors in the marketplace. AIM is the Aeronautical Institute of Maintenance. All across America, our... This is a recruiting advertisement. The Aeronautical uh, Institute of Maintenance is a very, is one of the largest sets of A&P mechanic schools in the United States. They're for-profit, like San Joaquin Valley College. And they have, I don't, I don't know how many, it's at least 10 different schools across the United States to go to A&P school. They might have more than 10. In any case, this is a recruiting video. Airports are bustling hubs of activity, getting travelers from point A to point B and serving as a true economic engine. A recent report shows the industry as a whole generated $1.3 trillion of annual economic activity and contributed over 10 million jobs. Many of these jobs can be found in the growing aviation industry itself. Because more and more commerce and passengers are taking to the skies, there is a huge need and demand for skilled, qualified aviation technicians, both here in the United States and abroad. This is due to several reasons. The increase of purchasing of jets, commercial airliners increasing their passenger transport, people going on vacation, business travel, as well as the baby boomer generation who's starting to retire. They're getting close to that age where they're going to be needing to be replaced. And that's where the void comes in of needing skilled aircraft technicians. The Aviation Institute of Maintenance offers a comprehensive program that prepares individuals for a career as an aviation technician. A trade school focusing primarily on training aircraft mechanics to work on everything from small prop planes to large turbine engines. The Aviation Institute of Maintenance has 11 aviation maintenance schools located in nine states, all certified and licensed by the Federal Aviation Administration. This training prepares students to pass the FAA exams and become certified airframe and power plant technicians and has successfully placed technicians with companies all over the world. We give people skilled, focused in specific training so they can get a career, a long-term employment to support themselves, support a family, and be able to grow within a company. The curriculum at Aviation Institute of Maintenance is regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. It's the highest and strictest standards for aviation in the world. And we've been doing this for more than four decades. 
we ask the industry folks, what do you need? What do you look for in a skilled worker? We take that information, we put it in our curriculum, and we teach those people those skill sets they need. So they come out, they are the model employee that the industry is looking for. The aviation industry is strong and growing globally. Over the next 20 years, it is projected that more new planes will be needed than ever before. Who will be there to fix these aircraft? The demand for aircraft technicians is at an all-time high. At AIM, you can learn all the skills needed to become an aviation maintenance technician, along with other specific areas of focus. These are skill sets that, once required, can launch a long, in-demand career. The education model that we have here at the Aviation Institute of Maintenance is uh, teach very complex situations, teach them very simple, uh, break them down so that the students can understand the concepts, the theories, and how to approach uh, correcting uh, mechanical issues that might be have a deficiency in some way, but it's also about teaching them the right attitude so that they can set their goals and set realistic expectations on what to experience when they graduate from our school. As the aviation industry continues to fly high, employers are counting on schools like AIM to keep turning out skilled, qualified aviation maintenance technicians. A few of the technical skills we look for to be successful in aerospace manufacturing and aviation maintenance include the ability to read and interpret blueprints, structural assembly, electrical routing, systems testing, and coding applications. We produce the world's most advanced technological aircraft, and we need people who are interested to come to work for us in well-paying careers in aviation and aerospace manufacturing. We're looking for the mechanical aptitude, which is extremely important to us, and we really expect the 147 schools to be able to provide the training that says, how do I properly do lockout, tag out, clean up, FOD locks, teach compliance systems, tool control, uh, because those are the basics you need when you come into the industry. Every airline out there has a technical side covered. We have initial training on the different fleets, and we're going to teach you what you need to know. The 147s have to instill those basics for us to be successful once they start working for Delta. Everything I've learned of AIM and, and the position that it has put me in today, it's really a, a turning point for me. It's a life-changing event. I used to work 60 hours, two job. My wife works. And there are less time with the family, but now I can do one job, my wife can work less hours, and I still end up having a good weekend at home. The best part of my job is seeing people grow when they come to our school, have an idea of what they think they want to do, and for 21 months I get an opportunity to see them grow and change and become a professional person. A career in aviation has been around for a while and it's going to continue to progress. And we're going to need technicians to continue to advance with that as it grows. But it all starts with your airframe and power plant certification. That's the basis for your, your bedrock of education. If you're interested in becoming one of the vital cogs that help keep the aviation industry soaring into the future, learn more today about the Aviation Institute of Maintenance, FAA approved maintenance training. For more information, Call 1-888-FIX-JETS or visit aviationmaintenance.edu. Last one. I'm Laura Mansevich. I'm an aircraft mechanic for Delta Airlines. We have many things that we need to do throughout the night. We do an initial walk around, check for our brakes, our tires, our lights, any pilot write-ups that we've got. As soon as we have done our walk around, we go up into the cockpit, check the hydraulics, check our engine oil. Sometimes we have to ring the wires out. We have to get a meters and gauges out there and see what the symptoms are of the aircraft and get a little bit more diagnostics going on, go through our schematics and narrow down and go from there. I got started by taking my brother to take a test to enter the Air Force. While I was waiting for him, one of the recruiters said, why don't you take the test also? And so I did, and next thing you know, the recruiter was calling me as an aircraft mechanic. I went straight up to the high school and asked the counselor, where could I go to school to become an aircraft mechanic? I had no idea. There was jobs out there. I started with a small commuter airline, then Delta called me up and said, would you like to come to Atlanta? I said, sure. This gave me a very comfortable living. You can get into the major airlines, 
You can get into small commuters. You can get into your corporate aviation. There's a very high demand for a good aircraft mechanic. The responsibility of being a mechanic is you've got to be able to have a very good character, very good responsible aspect within yourself. You've got to love action. You've got to love unexpected events happening. You've got to just love life. And if you love mechanical things, thinking outside of the box. And to know that this aircraft is going to leave the ground and, and leave with many people. I love my work. <laughs> I enjoy seeing what I worked on that night leave in the morning with happy passengers. And it's kind of exciting to know that you put a good product out at the end of your day. To know that, yeah, somebody else can enjoy their day now too. Six after. Six after.